comment, the general rule of the series is no hard questions, please. Uh, my area of specialization is narrowly focused in modern Eastern Europe, and I feel much more comfortable speaking about Jewish history, let's say from the 1700s onward in, in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Um, everywhere else is, I, I'm just reading it one chapter ahead of the rest of you. So no hard questions. Okay, let's go straight to the material then. By way of introduction, this is an old picture of me from before my beard grew in. I'm going to add a laugh track to this later. Um, <laughs> my name is Henry Abramson. I am a dean on this campus. I serve primarily in an academic capacity, uh, supervising faculty and students. Uh, my PhD is in history from the University of Toronto, and I was fortunate to spend a lot of time in some of the great universities of this world, uh, Harvard, Cornell, Oxford, the Hebrew University, and uh, sometime in, uh, around the same time as I was discovering, uh, you know, advanced study of Jewish history, I also discovered Torah primarily through the influence of my wife, and I uh, had the merit to study yeshivas like Or Sameach and several campuses, most notably in Jerusalem, and together that kind of forms my somewhat bifurcated personality to be very interested in academic Jewish history uh, with a strong focus on the traditional sources, as we shall see in uh, this discussion. I've written about six books, a couple of video documentaries, and um, lots of articles. Uh, this is uh, where we work. Obviously, you walked into this building, so you know what it looks like from the outside, but for those of you who are watching from Latvia, this is uh, the, uh, the campus here. Uh, we are very proud to have uh, a large number of students from the holy city of Brooklyn and beyond, and uh, we look forward to many years of tremendous growth, uh, specifically in Jewish history. I'd like to see that develop. And uh, this series is, of course, sponsored by an organization we call the Friends of Jewish History that uh, supports us primarily by giving money for scholarships for students. Okay. Um, now, the goal of this series, specifically this uh, semester, is to focus on Israel geographically, uh, looking at the land and its people. So in today's lecture, which will be slightly anomalous because it is an introductory material class, we're going to uh, discuss the land and its physical, physical geography in what the French historians call la longue durée, the, the long uh, passage, the long um, duration of Jewish history in Israel. Uh, and then we're going to focus in on specific individuals who are, uh, who represent turning points in many ways in Jewish history. Today, of course, we'll speak about Abraham, uh, the founder of Jewish society, Jewish ideology in Israel. We'll go on to Joshua, the period of the conquest. Uh, we'll move all the way up to the 20th century to Yitzchak Rabin. Uh, this happens to be a great photograph, by the way. I rarely bother putting in credits because they're just off the internet, but Yaakov Naomi, if you see him online, he, he has some amazing photographs of Jewish life in Israel. Uh, I was motivated to change the focus this semester over previous semesters, which were purely biographical, uh, because of two events in our national life and one in my personal life. Uh, in our national life, you know, we have gone through now in early 2017 a, a very tumultuous political season. It shows no signs of slowing down. Uh, but I was personally very disappointed by the uh, relationship of the previous administration to contemporary Israeli politics, and especially disheartened by the vote in the United Nations that um, just made me feel like, you know what, I have to stand up and in whatever way I can try and bolster the perhaps flagging spirit of those who support the state of Israel. And so as a result, I came up with this idea of dedicating this semester specifically to Israel and underlining the Jewish connection with the land of Israel, which seems to be in doubt in many circles in the international community. The second issue, which is much more personal, is that um, my, uh, my son, Alexander, uh, decided to make Aliyah and to become a chayal boded, a lone soldier. Very, uh, thank you, a very uh, perilous and uh, difficult journey that uh, he is undertaking entirely on his own. And uh, besides sending money, I thought that promoting a series like this would help um, confer merit on my son so that he and the rest of the members of the armed forces there 
and in fact all of the citizens of the region and inhabitants of the region enjoy peace and good health. So that's, that's the overall introduction to the series. Uh, one last comment, very important. Uh, we're grateful to Mr. Christopher Bray, uh, who watches these videos uh, from Florida. And uh, he's uh, associated with Ariel Capital Advisors, and he is generously sponsoring this, tonight's lecture. Uh, sponsorships are $250 per lecture. We give the lectures whether we're sponsored or not. We believe in providing this information for free and uh, promoting it more widely, but the money helps us fund uh, student scholarships, which is the, the main point of why we're doing this. Okay, enough introductory material. Let's talk about Israel itself. So again, taking the perspective of um, the, la longue durée, the long duration, trying to understand the history of this region, we have to spend some time looking at the physical geography of Israel. Let us try to understand a little bit about what it looks like on a very basic on-the-ground level. Now, I, I realize that most of you in this room will be extremely familiar with this material, and I apologize for the repetition. I will try to speak very fast so that it will not be too tedious, but for many on the Internet, uh, this will be relatively new. So Israel is, is quite a fascinating place. Here's a, a satellite photograph of it without political boundaries, which I think helps give some sense of, of how the territory is laid out. Um, the uh, political boundaries, of course, are seen on the news widely. You can see it's this tiny uh, yellow country uh, surrounded by Arab countries. Uh, this particular map uh, has the political distinctions that we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, you can see the gray area here of Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip because their political status is somewhat different. Also the Golan Heights on the north, uh, which is in this map labeled as Israel occupied, uh, even though it is annexed. Uh, the size of Israel is approximately 8,000 square miles. You can see it, it, the entire thing fits within the state of New York um, geographically, or to have a look at it in a little different perspective, it certainly fits well within the, uh, the British Isles, and if you put it within the context of the continental United States, it's really tiny. We are speaking about an incredibly small piece of territory that if it were to acquire as much territory as it has proportionately in the newspapers, then uh, it would, of course, be massive about the size of the Soviet Union or Russia, but uh, it is, in fact, quite a small territory. Um, let's look in a little more detail at the political boundaries as they are today in 2017. You can see this uh, lighter kind of camel color here is Israel proper, and that refers to the armistice lines of the 1948-1949 uh, War of Independence, in which Israel declared itself a state in 1948. Uh, they fought battles on all borders until not only did they secure their territory, they actually expanded a little bit, and this represents the region that was conquered. Very tiny wastes up here in the central region, um, and the this dotted line over here represents the so-called 1967 borders that are so prominent in the news today, because uh, in the Six-Day War of 1967, which we will discuss, God willing, in great detail at the end of this series, uh, Israel mounted very significant and successful military attacks on its neighbors uh, when they were threatened with destruction by another collective effort to push the Jews into the sea. And they conquered the uh, Gaza Strip, uh, this region here, which is known uh, widely as the West Bank because it is the West Bank of the Jordan River. It's also known as uh, Shomron and Yehuda by its biblical names, and then up in the far north, the Golan region, which is a mountainous region that um, used to belong to Syria. Uh, it's very important to understand that these territories were treated very differently because they have huge implications for any potential political solution to the, or diplomatic solution to the um, current conflict. Um, the area surrounding Jerusalem, which was unified in 1967, was annexed, meaning it was made part of Israel territory proper, uh, which had implications for the Arabs who lived in that region. Uh, the Golan Heights was similarly annexed, even though in this map, uh, which is from the CIA, by the way, 
the, uh, the map, the, the Golan Heights was also made part of Israel proper. Jerusalem was annexed because of its tremendous emotional, political, historical, spiritual value to the Jewish people. They wanted to have a single undivided capital. Uh, the Golan Heights was annexed primarily for strategic value because it is a, a high land overlooking the low land both to the northwest, right over the capital of Syria, Damascus, and also looking over to the southwest, uh, sorry, the northeast and the southwest look into the uh, Galilee, the Galil Valley. And as a result, it has extreme importance militarily. So those two regions were claimed by Israel proper. These two regions, the West Bank as a whole, excluding uh, the area around Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, were left open for some kind of proposed future negotiation that would perhaps demarcate the official boundaries of Israel in exchange for a lasting peace. Uh, that, of course, did not occur. I know everyone in this room, this is a very basic review of history, but that did not occur. Um, the West Bank remains to this day occupied. It did not go back to Jordan. Gaza, of course, um, was abandoned by Israel in the so-called disengagement of 2003, and it is uh, run entirely by Hamas, a, uh, an Arab group that is considered a terrorist group by the United Nations, by America, I should say, the United States. Uh, but it's bounded on three sides by Israel and one side by Egypt. Um, so the, it has closed boundaries as a result. So that's a very quick lightning look at the political boundaries. What's the population? If you look at Israel, uh, the, the camel color here plus the two annexed regions around Jerusalem and the Golan Heights, you've got about 8.2 million of whom 75% are Jewish. The other 25% who are primarily Arab Muslims, also a significant number of Arab Christians, have citizenship. They are, in fact, Israeli citizens, serve in, some uh, do serve in the army, the Druze, for example. Uh, they serve in parliament, and they participate actively in the life of Israeli society. The West Bank has about 2.7 million inhabitants. That's referring to non-Israeli citizens only. There are also several hundred thousand Jews who are living in the region around Jerusalem and at scattered points throughout the West Bank. Gaza is uh, emptied of Jews after the disengagement, and it has approximately 1.7 million Arabs. So that's a very quick overview of the, the map. Um, I will pause if anyone has any questions of this lightning review. That's uh, a politically charged way of saying it. All of the vocabulary here is very difficult to, you know, language is a weapon. And whatever kind of term you use, I'm trying to be very neutral as possible because we do have a wide viewership and I want to reach them. Um, like just referring it to the West Bank instead of calling it Yehuda and Shomron already says something. Occupied, though, in a technical term, and this is the term that we use in the CIA maps as well, means that uh, they are not extending citizenship to the people who live there. Uh, they are not expelling them and they're not annexing the territory. So I, uh, perhaps a better term that is also used in Israeli materials is administered. But what does administered actually mean? I'm an administrator. You know, does that mean I'm administering this territory? Occupied, I think, conveys just a slight bit more meaning. That was almost a hard question. If you ask another hard question, I don't know. Oh, that's a really hard question. But uh, as when, when we will see when we get towards the end of this class, um, the demographics are crucial to the argument, and Jewish de the number the population of Jews was remarkably low, except in certain centers like Hebron, the population of Jews was remarkably low. Let's we'll get to it in really fine granular detail towards the end of the semester. We we'll get to the 20th century. Right now, I'm just giving you a quick forspice advance notice of where we're headed. Okay, let's look at the geographic regions, though, after we looked at the political. Israel is, of course, a, a country of absolutely incredible geographic diversity. I mean, you have in the south the Arava region, the uh, the desert of the Negev. And by the way, my son, the Chayal Boded, he didn't tell me he was going to do this. He just told me afterwards he hiked alone from Beersheba to Elat. I mean, that was crazy. It was like a multiple-day hike alone 
you know, hardly any water or supplies, sleeping on the side of the road. You just hiked it. I know. What are you going to do when you're 17 and you're just, you know, full of that kind of energy? Uh, but, you know, it's, this is a really arid desert region. And if you go to the north, Mount Hermon, you have skiing. You actually have snowfall in the, the highest mountain to the north of Israel. Uh, if you go to the uh, coastal region, you have an extremely fertile area where a tremendous amount of our agriculture. And similarly, you have that in the Galilee region in the north. Uh, and then when you go following the, the Jordan River down southwards at the bottom of the Dead Sea, you actually have the lowest point on the face of the earth. Uh, remarkable contrasts in, in space within, again, let us recall, this is only about 8,000 square miles. So it's really a phenomenal microcosm of many different climates within a remarkably small space. So let's now, we spent about 15 minutes on introductory materials. Let's look a little bit at what it was like in the ancient period, uh, when it's often referred to as Canaan or Canaan in the biblical sources. Uh, Canaan, or Israel, land of Israel, was part of the Fertile Crescent, which represented the earliest regions of agriculture in the ancient Near East. You've got this region here, which is known as Mesopotamia, uh, taken from the word meso, meaning between, and potamos, meaning rivers. Between the two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, which have uh, periodic flooding from the highlands in Central Asia, and the water flows down here to the Persian Gulf. So once the Sumerians in particular uh, developed some uh, ways of controlling the water flow, they were able to develop significant agriculture surrounding those two rivers. And they, uh, they expanded dramatically because with the surplus of uh, income that reliable agriculture provided, they were able to eventually develop a very advanced civilization. It is in this region, of course, that our story begins with Abraham, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The other major region of uh, significant agriculture in the, in the ancient Near East is, of course, the Nile River, which flows from south to north, hence the upper and the lower Nile, uh, with this huge delta region over here where you have regular water flow and uh, irrigation is possible off of the uh, Nile River. It's bordering basically basically on the Sahara Desert and the Sinai Desert over here. So it's really quite an amazing thing that you would have this extensive period of reliable uh, agriculture. And again, uh, I, I don't think I've told you this before. Maybe I have last semester, some of you. Uh, the, um, have I told you the Abramson Rule of History? Does anyone remember that? I don't think so. No undergraduates in the room. When you don't know the answer for something, why something happens, why a phenomenon exists, the answer can usually be expressed in one word. Anyone have an idea of that word? Money, exactly, money. When you don't know why something happens, money is probably the region. So if you want to know why is it that civilization developed in Mesopotamia, in the Nile River Valley, in the Yellow Yangtze River Valley, and so on, the answer is money. Because when you have that reliable water source, you have reliable agriculture, you have concentration of, of, uh, of produce, surplus of produce, with a surplus of produce you can pay for things like high priests and scribes and culture of all types. So that's why we have this ancient region. Now, the land of Israel is a moderately fertile region uh, in comparison to the Nile and to the Mesopotamian regions, but more significantly for our purposes is it is a, a region to traverse between those two other regions. Uh, Canaan, Lebanon as well, this is where people would basically travel when they're going from the Nile to the Euphrates or vice versa. It's extremely important as a transitional zone, as a liminal zone, and as a result, it captured a lot of uh, different cultures and ideas of peoples going back and forth throughout this region. If you look at uh, the way uh, inhabitants of Canaan would have understood themselves, um, this is a map from the 6th century, the so-called Medeba map, and I've transliterated some of the uh, the Greek that's written here. Uh, it's 
facing to the east, right? North is that way. Um, you have uh, Ashdod here, Yehuda, the Dead Sea, and further outward. Jerusalem is over here, Yericho over there. And the, uh, the way that ancient uh, Israelites would have oriented themselves, and in fact you see that also in the biblical Hebrew language, they would have oriented themselves in such a way that eastward meant forward. Mizrach really means forward, um, meaning towards the uh, advancing. And that this is the way they would have seen their world. Looking at what we know about trade routes, there are basically two big roads that traverse through ancient Israel and one sea route. The Derech Hayam, the sea route, of course, followed the coastline. Uh, and then you had the so-called Via Maris, uh, which goes over here. Sorry, this is the, uh, the Via Maris is this one here, this red line that uh, hugs the coast, kind of like A1A down in Florida. Uh, and the Derech HaMelech, the King's Road, would go uh, up on the other side of the Jordan River. And then they would connect up around Damascus, and then you can make your way over to Babylon that way. And these were the two main routes that were traveled up and down Israel following the food supply, uh, and we see this uh, marked upon in many places in Scripture and other um, um, other sources for the period. So looking at Abraham, uh, he falls within this mysterious character of uh, those who come from across the river. Uh, we will explore next week, God willing, when we look at uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, uh, Joshua, uh, the, and the concept of the, um, the so-called Apiru people, or Habiru people, which many scholars believe can be identified with the Hebrews. Uh, there are some doubts about that, because when they have dug up some of the archaeological sites associated with the Apiru, they have found absolutely no evidence that they had a diet of Chinese food. So a lot of questions about it. But for the time being, this you know, you have this phrase like in Yona Ivri Anochi, I am from the other side, Ever Hanahar, from the other side of the river. Uh, and we clearly see this with Abraham. Looking at this map here, which, whoops, we'll go further back. This is the map of the uh, ancient world. And you can see the green color here gives you some sense of the foodstuffs. Uh, that sort of traces the map of Abraham's journey as described in the book of Genesis. He starts out here in the uh, the um, the most early region of uh, of Babylon of Sumeria uh, regions where they're populated uh, the, the landscape is dotted with these things called ziggurats a uh, very massive high civilization region uh, a lot of stories associated with Abraham there and then uh, he makes his way up river to war along the Euphrates to this region of Haran and in this is the region of Haran. Just go back one slide here. Uh, Haran here in the north, which would be, you know, somewhat north of Aleppo here in this map in contemporary Syria. And this it appears to be how Abraham refers to his own birthplace when he sends his servant Eliezer, for example, to find a bride for his son. Uh, he sends him to Haran, not to Ur. So there's a lot of interesting discussion among the com commentaries, the Ramban. Uh, my good friend Rabbi Yaakov Trump, no relation, had a, uh, he shared with me the other day uh, a beautiful passage in the, the Ramban's commentary on the Torah that addresses the issue of how come Avraham is apparently from Ur, from Haran, and it seems to be the consensus is that uh, he spent his childhood in Ur, but then with his father, they lived in Haran later on in life, and that's where, where he associated much of his activity. Uh, looking at this archaeological dig here, uh, some of the ruins of Haran. I just want to mention that one of the problems that we will encounter in the first few weeks of this course is using archaeological data to support the biblical narrative, which is a fraught with problems. Uh, for a long time, many scholars believed that whenever you found the foundations of houses that had four distinct rooms, that was a uniquely Jewish form of architecture. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, 
And also, if you found in the uh, the various archaeological digs an absence of pig bones, because pigs were domesticated by that time, but Jewish civilizations, uh, according to the laws of Kashrut, would not keep pigs. Many archaeologists, however, have questioned these particular um, sort of uh, axioms and have argued that they, they don't necessarily conform to reality. Uh, looking at homes today, for example, it's hard to understand what would specifically make a home architecturally more Jewish than a non-Jewish home. But nevertheless, we'll leave that for uh, next week when we look at Joshua in greater detail. Um, and then finally, he makes his way down to the south, um, eventually to the region of Hebron, uh, where uh, he is buried in the Marat Machpelah, the cave of the uh, pears, as it is called, and much of his life story is told in the city of Hebron. Uh, he of Hebron. He also has a, a brief trip into Egypt. So this, the Fertile Crescent, in other words, is really the stomping grounds of Abraham, quite literally, and describe his um, biography within the same geographic region as we have the uh, surplus of food because of the water flow. Any questions or arguments to this point? Perfectly clear as noonday. Okay, so let's move on. And let's look at our sources. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. First of all, let's just place Abraham's life within a chronology so we understand exactly when we are speaking about here. And again, I apologize to many of you in this audience for whom this is uh, literally day school material. Uh, the, those of you on the Internet will perhaps find it more uh, novel. So if we take a, a timeline and we place the year zero right here in the middle, zero, of course, in the common era, the way that we count uh, years in the secular form today, and we put us up over here in the year 2017, and this is the context where we have Israeli statehood. Um, looking backwards towards the scope of Jewish history, you have the uh, Roman exile at the end of the first century, uh, and then much further back you have the conquest of Israel by Joshua around 1300 before the Common Era, and then all the way back here in the year 2000, more or less, uh, ironically 1948, uh, is the, uh, the era of Abraham and the patriarchs. So roughly going all the way back to zero, and then again is the period that we are discussing today. From a historiographic perspective, the difficult part is that almost all of this period is totally reliant on Hebrew sources, meaning internal Jewish sources such as, notably, the Bible. We do not have a lot of external markers that explicitly and indubitably validate the narrative that we have in the Bible. So if we step back, because we are, after all, in a college, and we think about this in other contexts, if we were referring to, let's say, Chinese history or uh, Native American history or something like that, when you don't have external data points to validate a historical narrative, the tendency is to place that within a lower level of epistemological value and say it is in the realm of, let's say, legend rather than history or memory, culture, tradition, heritage, those kinds of words rather than history. And this is a major debate that rages within the, uh, the world of biblical uh, archaeology as scholars try to understand how do we deal with uh, this particular period of history, which is so foundational not only to Jewish culture, but to Judeo-Christian culture and Islamic culture as well, how do we assimilate the, uh, the absence of external validators for this narrative? Uh, I have several scientists in the room, and you would know that one of the uh, hallmarks of the scientific method, of course, is if you can replicate it. Uh, and if you only have one experiment... You know, you can't really make too many judgments based on that single data point. So let's look at what sources we have and try to understand what we can get from them. Uh, and we have actually quite a few interesting sources. It's not at all, and by the way, let me just take a, a half a step back and say, I want to remind you that my area of specialization is way later than this. Uh, I did my PhD in modern Eastern Europe. I did one minor area in medieval Russia, but otherwise... You know, in my 
period of history, we have so many things. We have literature, we have art, we have architecture, we have, you know, graffiti. We have tons of data points to validate a historical record. I feel so bad for these people studying ancient history because they like, they find a piece of a broken pot and they can spend their life studying that little piece of broken pot and trying to squeeze every kind of little bit of data point out of it. It's very hard. So let's look at some of those broken pots and try to understand what we can. We have the Amarna letters, which are from the 14th century before the Common Era. Uh, again, that's about 600 years after the life of Abraham by traditional chronology. Uh, these are uh, letters, of course, the uh, the actual material is clay, uh, and the um, the inscriptions, as you can see, is cuneiform. A cuneiform means literally wedge shaped, because the way they would write these things is they would have soft clay, and they would have like a, a wedge shaped tool, which looked suspiciously like a single chopstick. Some people say that ancient civilizations of Egypt eventually died out because they could not innovate a second chopstick. And so it was very difficult to eat. Sorry about that. So they would take the wedge-shaped chopstick and they would uh, make these, uh, you know, quite um, distinctive markings, which were essentially degraded from ideograms, pictograms, into these kind of symbols. Uh, and then the clay would harden. And that gave a tremendous, uh, you know, longevity. And that's what makes it available to us uh, you know, 3,600 odd years later. The, um, uh, the, the Amarna letters are basically letters back and forth to Egypt, which deal with all kinds of uh, material affairs related to the royal house. Uh, the, the pharaoh at the time had moved his capital, and he left behind a whole bunch of junk, including an archive that uh, included these Amarna letters. Yes, Professor Levine. Right, exactly, Akhenaten. See, this is... This is why it's really hard to, to say anything in this building because there's so many smart people. He's a professor of biology, you know. You're, you're not supposed to know these things, but you're absolutely right. So what happened is they left behind the archive. The archive was found. What did they say about ancient Israel? Um, a fair bit, but it's primarily from the perspective of Egypt. They don't say anything about Abraham. They don't have any details for us. They have things like place names. They have things like uh, conflicts between the inhabitants of Israel and Egyptians and so on. But it's limited in value for our purposes. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This one is actually contemporary with the period of Abraham, quite a bit earlier. The Egyptians used to do this thing called uh, make execration texts. This is so funny. I love this. Execration is another word for um, voiding waste. You know, just use your imagination a little bit. I think there are some young people. There's a young person in this room. So, you know, it's a, it's a word for voiding waste. And basically what they used to do, this is hilarious, is if they didn't like someone or some culture or something like that, what they would do is they would take the single chopstick, they would write down in like a clay figurine like this, that all kinds of bad things should happen to that person. He should bury his head in sand and should, fleas should come to him, things like that. And then they would ceremonially break the, the clay. And that was like a way of saying, now it's really going to happen. This curse is going to happen. Uh, nowadays, we have an interesting sort of way that we've incorporated that even to Jewish tradition. Does anyone know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about the, the Tanaim, right, at the wedding, where the mothers-in-law both break the plate. I don't think they're thinking the same thing, though, about their children. But nevertheless, this is a fun habit. So in these execration texts, of course, you find references to Israel, as the Egyptians have various problems with the Israelis or the people who lived in Israel, and they wrote them down. And so we have a few odds and ends. Again, they don't say enough to really give us satisfaction as to what's going on in Israel at the time of the patriarchs, but we definitely have references to it. There was interaction between the peoples there, and we have to try as best we can to tease out meaning from these uh, limited bits of information. Then, of course, we have archaeology which is a fascinating science, completely different from the kind of work that I trained in as a historian, but uh, fascinating for its techniques. But how does archaeology work? Again, I apologize for the basic nature of this, but basically uh, when civilizations create cities, 
or towns, uh, they tend to locate themselves along tactically and strategically advantageous locations uh, by sources of fresh water, uh, easily defended outposts, things like that. And as a result, when one civilization rises or falls, um, it just makes more sense for the next civilization to build on the exact same spot. And so they just build, rather than trying to cart away all the foundations of earlier homes and things, they just build right over it. And so you have in, in ancient Israel the development of these mounds, which are easily identifiable, called tells. Uh, Tel Aviv, the city, is named as the, the mound of spring, right? Like the re- reference to a uh, an archaeological dig there. And so archaeologists can go out to that mound and carefully dig up the dirt and hope to find things as they move down the dirt. The lower down you go, the older the civilization would be. Um, and uh, they, wherever they find something, they have to really carefully analyze not only what it is, but exactly where it was found. Because one piece of broken clay is often totally indistinguishable from another piece of broken clay that could be 500 years older or younger. And the way they have to uh, determine this is based on its placement. Obviously, if you have sloppy archaeologists who just go in there with shovels and start digging things around looking for treasure, they completely ruin the site, and it's impossible to make any analysis of this. But once that is said and done, if it's, if it's analyzed properly, you can really find out a lot about how a civilization grew, developed, and so on, based on not only the architecture that's found there, but what is cast off, like the broken pots, um, bones of animals, human remains in some cases, small ritual items like clay figurines, things like that. Whatever the Detroitists are that's simply left behind can give you a lot of insight into the civilization as well. Furthermore, when you analyze things like the pottery, a great deal has been made out of the style of the pottery, the materials that it is made with, the coloring of the pottery, because that sometimes gives you some indication as to where it comes from. For example, if you were to perform an archaeological dig in our kitchen, it wouldn't take very long because my wife is extremely organized, but you would find something called china in the cabinet. And China, just by its very name, indicates that it's a high level of commerce and that obviously we're buying things from the other side of the globe. Uh, actually, it's from Denmark more, but that you get the idea of how these things work. You would also find that it's broken in many places, which leads you to the understanding that we have lots of little kids constantly breaking our China. You don't want to hear that stuff. Let's go on. Okay, so... Um, Unfortunately for us as historians, when we want to take this archaeological data back to Abraham and understand something about the patriarchs, we are once again stymied because the margin for error is so huge. You know, whether you find uh, this piece of pottery six inches higher or six inches lower completely changes your conclusions. And uh, so many of the tentative conclusions that have been reached about the ancient period, the period of the patriarchs in particular, have been turned over by later scholars, uh, much to the disappointment of biblical archaeologists who are looking for validation of the text. Uh, One example is, for example, is we have uh, very few really uh, known historical events described in the period of the patriarchs that we can date with archaeological means. One of them that's kind of exciting, though, is the reference in Genesis chapter 14 of the war of the four kings and the five kings, in which Abraham, of course, participates quite actively, uh, especially as expanded in the Medrash. Uh, And what we know about it from the biblical narrative is that there are kings that descend from the uh, region of Syria. They make their way down to uh, the lower uh, Negev region, and then back up, and then later they are somehow uh, defeated, and Abraham pursues them uh, further to the north. And archaeological evidence has indicated a large number of civilizations that were all destroyed at the same time in this region, which is tantalizingly close to pointing to the war of the four kings and the five kings. Of course, archaeologists have a tremendous debate over the exact timing of that destruction, and they were never rebuilt again, by the way, Uh, but that's the closest we really get to a firm archaeological validation of text from Genesis. 
uh, well, from the period we're talking about. So what we're left with essentially is the Torah as a source book for us. And on the one hand, that is totally amazing. That's fantastic. There's so much detail, so much literary value, so much historical value in the Torah. Uh, and so why don't we just adopt it as a straight-up historical guide? So there are many reasons that I could advance in this context uh, to the problematics of that assertion. Uh, perhaps the most basic is that the Torah does not appear to be written as a guide to history. The Torah is fundamentally a religious document, and however you want to approach the text of the Torah, if you approach it as I do, as a God-given document, and every single detail of that text is completely divine and authentic and authoritative, it is nevertheless lacking if we want to find out a really clear chronology of events, even for something as simple as the life of Abraham, which tends to be rather episodic in nature. So let us uh, retreat from this for a moment. Before we look at the question of historicity, I will take a quick question. Arguments? Discussions? Yes, please. So let me take you now to the problem of historicity and what I'd like to call the Zaidi paradox. Um, I, after doing a, a, you know, a, a marginal review of the literature on this subject, I'm what some archaeologists would call, quote-unquote, a conservative maximalist, uh, which means my approach is, I believe in the Torah, and if you can show me stuff that proves it, I think that's fantastic, like proves it from an external point of view. I think that's fantastic. If you show me stuff that doesn't prove it or discounts it, I say, well, that's very interesting. I don't know what that means. And I move on because, you know, well, we'll see why in a second. Um, so what are the problems, though? If we were to have a discussion about the period of Abraham in the sources, what do we have? The first is we have no non-Jewish source confirmation. It's very difficult for historians. We like to have multiple validation points for anything that we assert. Secondly, we have a difficulty confirming the chronology. As I mentioned in the, the War of the Four Kings and the Five Kings, which looks like a really great confirmation, but it may be off by several centuries, which is very problematic. And third, this is my favorite, apparent anachronisms. For example, um, uh, the camels figure prominently in several stories of the patriarchs. Um, Re Rebecca, for example, famously falls off her camel when she first sees her husband Isaac, right? The Nafal al Meal Hagamal, I think it says. And archaeologists say, wait a second, camels, we have no evidence of their domestication in the region for another 1,100 years, or excuse me, 800 years. We don't have camel bones in any great concentration until quite a bit later. So it must be that this story is incorrect, based on the appearance of the camel. And there are a few details like this, but the camel's my favorite one. So what do you do with these kinds of facts? Uh, let me give you the Zaidi paradox. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to take you a little bit into personal family history. So here's my mom and dad. Uh, my mom is the one on the left. And um, this is one of their wedding day. You know, they got into the back of a car in Montreal and they drove off. I, of course, know each of these people well. Uh, I interact with them. I have personal um, firsthand knowledge of their lives. If we go back a little further, here's my Zadie and my Bubby, my grandfather and my grandmother. Um, and um, this picture was taken in around 1925. Um, and uh, I also have personal first-hand knowledge of them. Uh, my grandmother, Allah Shalom, passed away in 1969. Or sorry, my grandfather in 69, my grandmother in 1971. But I can say with the force of witness testimony that, yeah, I saw them. I interacted with them. Um, here is on the, the top is my, my grandmother, on the other side, believe me, there's a point to this. Uh, and because we all came from the same little region of Lithuania, they actually knew each other. My mother's family and my father's family knew each other. Well, here is my grandmother holding her future son-in-law, my father, uh, when he was about four or five years old. I'm not sure she would have been so pleased had she known he would marry her daughter. But 
I have direct first-hand information about SAFTA as well. That's it. You know, I was born in Canada. I can go back to generations of people that I knew personally. But my SAFTA did tell me about these people, my great-grandfather, Yaakov David, and his wife, Devora. It's one of their daughters, Hadassah, in the middle there. I never met them, but I have a strong belief in their existence because I interact with a person who claimed to have first-hand interaction with them as a result, and I will rely on her testimony. I have other multiple markers, too, because my own father, Allah Shalom, was named Yaakov David after Yaakov David, who was known as the town Chacham, and so they, there's a, another data point to prove that these people actually existed. But if you want to go back further than, say, 1920 in Lithuania, then we have a serious problem. I can go on Ancestry.com, and I can find out, okay, a Victor Abramson, who was probably born sometime around 1839, um, and he was born, he was, uh, born to Schmelko Abramson. That's a great name. I, I'm not sure. That's probably from Shmuel. Schmelko, right? Uh, Marcus. That's probably from Marks and Spencer, I'm thinking, maybe. Okay. Uh, 1780. Uh, there's a Mordcha in 1760, and then the census records in Lithuania run out. And so what do I have to say about my mystery Zaidi? Do I say he didn't exist? Do I say there was no such mystery Zaidi? Because I have no validation anywhere, anytime for the mystery Zaidi. Obviously, that would be absurd. So the mystery Zaidi is there, and I believe that he existed. I just don't know much about him. I also have, to add to this, a huge family connection. Here you have uh, three cousins the rather hirsute guy on the left is me, believe it or not, circa 1980. We all share, first cousins, we all share the same narrative of a common ancestor that we never met and we don't have any other data about. To posit that because we don't have any external validations for their existence outside of our own internal heritage is an absurdity. The fact that we exist, the fact that we live and breathe and call ourselves Abramsons is in itself, ipso facto, a proof to the existence of this Ur ancestor, this earlier ancestor, Abraham. Now, you might want to say, well, what about the camels then? What do you do with the camels? So I can tell you that with, we go back to my great-grandfather, Yaakov David, who I mentioned was the sage. Um, the, my, the only, I only know two stories about him. Um, and they were both told to me by my grandmother, Allah Shalom, who had a somewhat wicked and nasty and, uh, she had a, a strange sense of humor. And, um, I'm not sure if the stories that she told were 100% accurate. But nevertheless, I will tell them to you very quickly. One story is that he was so engrossed in studying uh, a manuscript of the Rambams uh, that he held the candle too close and the top of the page caught fire. And uh, Yaakov David refused to put out the fire until he had finished the paragraph. The other story they tell about him is that he used to joke around with a lot of the young people in town. He used to like, you know, smile at the young girls and make little comments and things like that. And my grandmother, Allah Shalom, says that when they said to him, Yaakov David, what are you doing? You know, you're a Tamar Chacham. You're, you're an elder in the town. It's not right for you to be speaking like this with young people. And he said to them, apparently, according to my grandmother, Allah Shalom, not even a Tamar Chacham can eat potato latkes every day. Kind of an enigmatic statement. Uh, variety is the very spice of life, things like that. Now, uh, these two stories, that's all I know about Yaakov David, other than the fact that I know he existed and so on. So I, I have lots of questions on these stories. Like, for example, did he really not put out the, the, the page before it burned down? And what do you mean manuscript? He would, he's living in the 20th century. He would have a book, not a manuscript. It's like a camel. What's a camel doing here? Why would a guy living in a tiny little shtetl in Lithuania have a manuscript of the Rambam? So I might want to throw the whole story out the window and say, ah, look, this detail, it's an anachronism. It doesn't work. This also stretches credulity. And so as a result, I'm personally not bothered by the camel story. 
I think there are a lot of other reasons why we can get to the, the bottom of that story, uh, not for us today. Okay, so uh, even though we do suffer from a paucity of sources, we nevertheless have a phenomenal body of knowledge about this man, Avraham. It is, it's true, from a historiographic perspective, point of view, uh, qualified because these are all internal stories. But just like I stand together arm in arm with my cousins and we celebrate the the life of our esteemed mystery ancestor, how much more so can we celebrate the life of Avram Avinu? Now, Avraham, our father. So there are so many ways that we could go at the biblical text. I know that the vast majority of you in this room are very well acquainted with this story, and I'm sure you go through it every year. Perhaps you go through it twice every year, learning in the Aramaic translation as well. Uh, To summarize it, I'd like to really focus on the ten trials uh, of Abraham, which are uh, attested to in the later rabbinic literature. The biblical narrative itself, as I mentioned earlier, is, is rather episodic and sometimes truncated. Uh, it tends to emphasize a few really key details that resonate in the Middle East. Like, for example, Abraham is associated um, in the Kabbalistic vision with chesed, with kindness, with uh, going out of his way to help others. And a good example of that, of course, is um, when he greets the travelers who turn out later to be angels on their way to uh, do several things, including destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is something in a nomadic culture like uh, the the Middle East that uh, this would be extremely important because people are really at the edge of uh, survival in such an arid uh, climate. But the rabbis looking at these episodes of his life tend to uh, speak of ten trials, which are uh, accounted by several rabbis in different ways. Maimonides lists them here in this very commonly used list. Uh, His first trial was that immigration from Ur up to Haran and then into Israel. Uh, Second, the fact that he was plagued with famine in Israel and had to leave again, a second emigration, to Egypt, which did not work out well with Sarah kidnapped by Pharaoh temporarily. Uh, then he's engaged in that war of the four and five kings, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and then they endure, uh, then they have a, quite a bit of peace afterwards, but it is a peace that is not broken by the sound of childish uh, play because they are uh, lacking children. Uh, Sarah then offers him uh, her handmaid, Hagar, according to the rabbinic tradition, an Egyptian princess that came along with them. Uh, and then, of course, they have a lot of family dynamics that ensue as a result. Uh, he circumcises himself at the age of 99 um, and uh, in so doing identifies with um, the future Hebraic and Judaic tradition. Sarah is once again kidnapped um, and she's returned, but then she says, you know what, we can't live with Hagar and her son Yishmael, and so uh, he expels them both. And then finally, lastly, most significantly, the terrible, awful phenomenal story of the binding of Isaac, which I need not recount to this audience, but the, uh, the perhaps people on the internet might not be realized that according to Jewish tradition, Isaac was 37 years old at the time, which was calculated by looking at the age of his mother when she died and so on. This is certainly a massive turning point in religious history and had a phenomenal impact uh, for centuries down to our current day. I'll just focus on two individuals who uh, were turned around by the story of the Akedah, the Binding of Isaac. Soren Kierkegaard, a very important 19th century philosopher who was so moved from a Christian perspective uh, by the story of the Binding of Isaac that he expressed it as the existentialist religious mission of the contemporary period, meaning Abraham was faced with this terrible choice where on the one hand God had promised him that Isaac would be his progeny and the future of the Jewish people. And at the same time, God was saying, and now I will ask you to slaughter your son and destroy the progeny. And on on a simple human level, on a parental level, just the act itself is is so repellent and so difficult to understand. But on a philosophical level, what Kierkegaard really highlighted, although many of the uh, rabbinical writers had also said it in sources that were unavailable to him much earlier, that this constituted 
a, uh, as they say in Aramaic, a stira mine ube, a, an internal contradiction. How can you say that Isaac is going to be the future of the Jewish people and at the same time say that you want me to kill him? I cannot handle the philosophical tension between those two logical statements, which are, have the, an excluded middle. And as a result, Kierkegaard coined the term leap of faith in reference to Abraham. That leap over the, uh, the obvious absurdity of it into a religious mindset. Uh, another figure, not nearly as well known, but uh, a, a, a former study partner of mine when I was studying in Jerusalem, Rabbi Natan Gamidzi, fascinating individual. I, I reference him here to give you a sense of the wide scope of his influence. Um, Nati was uh, uh, actually of the royal family of Swaziland. If you go look up his name on the internet, you'll see his story. It's really amazing. There's been documentaries made on it, things like that. And uh, he was studying in South Africa. He's a brilliant guy. And um, he told me that he was standing in line uh, to take a course in Russian. He really wanted to learn Russian. But the course was closed out. And uh, so he was looking for another language to take. There was a pretty girl standing in a line for another language course. So he stood next to her. And he noticed that she was reading right to left. And he said, what's that you're reading? She said, I'm reading Hebrew. And he said, okay. And he thought to himself, she's a pretty girl. Maybe I'll get to sit next to her. So he took the class in Hebrew and uh, things went on from there. He told me that when he read, really within the first semester, when he read the Akedah, which is written, it's Genesis chapter 22, very basic Hebrew. When he read it, he was absolutely overwhelmed by it. It was absolutely nothing like he had read in his native Swaziland, nothing culturally like what he had experienced growing up. And he began a spiritual quest that ultimately ended in his conversion and later rabbinic ordination in Jerusalem. So phenomenal transformational power of the story of Abraham is very relevant to us in our day. Uh, the Abrahamic tradition, of course, goes on in great detail. In future lectures, by the way, I'd like to spend a lot more time on the biography and less than I did today on the kind of background material. But in Jewish tradition, there's a tremendous expansion of discussion of Abraham's role in the uh, rabbinic literature, the Midrash, the Talmud, Kabbalistic literature, and so on. Uh, he is seen in the Jewish tradition as the father of monotheism. And there are different roots as to how that's understood. Uh, for Philo and Maimonides, he's understood as kind of like a uh, rational uh, deduction that God must exist, one single God. For others, like Yehuda Levi, Rabbi Soloveitchik in our own time, argue that it's more of a mystical leap, like Kierkegaard's leap of faith. Uh, in the Christian tradition, of course, Abraham is extremely important. And in fact, of figures in the uh, Jewish part of the Bible, the so-called Old Testament, uh, he is the second most um, mentioned figure in the New Testament um, besides Moses. And in the Muslim tradition, of course, he is the father of Yishmael, as he is in the Jewish tradition, uh, the builder of the Kaaba, the central shrine in Mecca, which is the um, the destination of the pilgrims to that land. Um, and uh, the term Islam itself, which means one who submits, like uh, Israel literally means one who struggles, the, he who will struggle. Uh, the term Islam here refers to Abraham's submission to God. So the very basis of the Muslim faith, its nomenclature, goes back to Abraham. So that concludes my remarks on Abraham. I am very grateful for your patience throughout these 60 minutes. Um, I hope that uh, you'll join us next week when we look at the uh, controversy surrounding the conquest of Israel under Joshua, the, the Exodus, a lot of fascinating materials, and I hope you have an excellent night.